Welcome to Northside Community Church. We're seeing some old faces come back again. Welcome. Welcome to the trouble road there. Don't cause any trouble. Okay, you're back. Just don't cause any trouble. <laughs> they came with placards. You call that a message? Okay. <laughs> And again, we welcome as well new faces here that have come here, so it's awesome to have you welcome on Zoom and on YouTube. So good to be together. We're thankful that as a city, as a region, and as a province, we keep moving forward. Stage two, stage three, this is awesome. As life is getting back to normal, what we've been talking about last week and this week is that in the past 16 months, though, we've been experiencing lots of new normals. And as life gets back to normal, I wonder if there's some new normals that we want to make sure we don't give up on. New normals we've been experiencing in the past 16 months that we want to continue passionately pursuing. <clears throat> Last week we learned that two things that we want to make sure we keep passionately pursuing, that we don't give up on as part of our new normals. One of the first things I said is that life is a marathon, not a sprint, so make sure you take care of yourself. Because burning out benefits no one. I said, remember that, in this, that Jesus doesn't want us to live this constant, crazy, fast-paced, non-stop life. Even remember that storyline that we talked about <clears throat> where Jesus sent out the disciples two by two and they came back with all kinds of news of what God was doing. It was just amazing and all things. And you'd think that Jesus would be riding the wave and saying, hey, let's keep going. Let's press on. Instead, he pulled the disciples away and said, let's go and rest. Let's get something to eat. Make sure, make sure that in this new normal, as we move back to some sort of normalcy, you keep taking care of yourself. Get rest. Get some time with God. And that took us to our next new normal, the second new normal. This past 16 months, I've talked to people over and over again. You've shared with me that I've had to depend on God. I've had to trust God more and more in the past 16 months. Because you know why? Everything we once depended on was taken away from us. And as life gets back to normal, as we get more freedoms back again, as we start planning to be with family, as maybe we're getting back to our workplaces and getting more of a normal income, whatever it may be, I ask you, the Bible challenges us, keep depending on God. Because everything else that we used to depend on is temporary at best and can be taken away from us in an instant. And I said, how we do that is we keep remaining in Jesus, keep getting growing closer to Jesus, Remember, we read Timothy, uh, James said that, grow closer to Jesus, come closer to Jesus as he comes close to us. Now, part two. You're going to be happy with me when I share with you the next two normals. <laughs> when I, yeah, all right. <laughs> when I get to the third one, please don't walk out. Don't hang up on Zoom or on YouTube. The third one might not be the most pleasant thing to hear, but it's absolutely critically important. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for this morning. I thank you that we can gather together in this church building. More and more people, Father, coming here. Just to gather together the saints. I thank you that we can still do things online as well. For those who can't make it, Father, I just thank you that they can still join us online and be blessed with what you're doing in and through this message and in through the worship service and beyond. Father, right now I just ask that, please, I, I, I'm stepping back. I'm Steve Bachter is stepping back. I'm asking Jesus, you stand in front of me. And that we would hear your heart, your voice, your truth. And Jesus, your spirit is with us. And I ask that your spirit would move to encourage and even to convict, to challenge us this morning. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. If you're watching on YouTube or on Zoom, feel free to just enter in some comments and chats with one another, maybe something from the message that just spoke to you, or you want to say amen as well at the end of the prayer, you can type that in. It's part of the community that we want to build online as well. So let me start off by asking you a couple of questions. How many of us prefer the security and peace of mind of routine, of consistency, right? 
of, of knowing what's going to be happening next or coming down the road. We, we prefer knowing that, right? I mean, especially if we're planning a trip. We're planning a long road trip. We, we want to know two things. One is the destination, and the second is how we're going to get there, right? The route we're going to be taking. And I know that every one of us, when we go on a road trip, one of the signs we love seeing on the road, detour ahead. Yeah. <laughs> we love seeing that sign, don't we? Right? Imagine if you saw that sign not just once, twice, three times, but half a dozen times on your route towards your destination. And you're still not out of a kitchener. Yeah, you're still not out of kitchener. <laughs> Oh, man, Doug, I'm going to have to have you right beside me here. So we can do this tandem thing together. <laughs> now a trip that was supposed to take three, four hours is like six, seven, eight hours long. How many of us would just love and relish those kinds of detours? Right? No, we don't. After Jesus' resurrection and before he ascended into heaven, he brought his disciples together. And he asked them to hang tight. Wait, in Jerusalem, I'm going to send you my spirit. And then he gave them a mission. He said, I'm going to send you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Hey, the disciples are like, awesome. We know Jerusalem. We're familiar with Jerusalem. People know us. Looking forward to it. All right, let's do it, Jesus. Jerusalem and Judea. Wow. Wow, the region. That's awesome. Jesus, can't wait. Then he drops the bomb. And Samaria. What? Samaria? We don't get along. They're unclean. No, we just, what are you doing, Jesus? And to the ends of the earth. What? In essence, Jesus was telling his disciples that you're going to be experiencing a lot of detours ahead. <laughs> you're going to be experiencing a lot of new, unexpected normals as you move forward. And you know what? That's what the book of Acts reveals over and over again. The book of Acts reveals how Christ's church, the Christian church, is birthed and grew all over the known world. In the book of Acts, we see a lot of new normals happening. A lot of detours ahead. Some examples, the disciples, when they were given the instructions to go hang tight, the Holy Spirit will come on you. Do you think they expected that the Holy Spirit is going to come down on tongues of fire and all of a sudden they're all going to be able to speak a whole bunch of different languages and nations that are coming from all over in Jerusalem who understand the gospel message. How many people think that the disciples really expected that to happen? That's a total new normal. How many disciples expected that persecution was going to, in essence, take them, rip them away from their familiar territory and bring them into unfamiliar territory? What about Peter? What about Peter one time in a vision when he was praying? God brought down this white blanket and on it with a whole bunch of unclean animals. And God said to this Jew, take and eat. Are you kidding me, God? No way. I've never, my lips have never touched unclean animals. And God says, and do not ever call anything unclean that I have made clean. In essence, two messengers being sent to Peter. Guess what? In this new normal, you can eat whatever you want. And also, I'm about to send you to a Gentile home. And I want you to enter in. Do not call them unclean. They're also part of the family of God. I want to bring them into my heaven. Oh, wait a minute. You thought those were some quite the new normals and the unexpected detours. Oh, there is a biggie that happened. A biggie that happened as the church was growing. Circumcision was no longer necessary. 1,500 years, circumcision was a critically important part of, of the Jewish religion. You cannot be part of the God's family. You cannot be part of Abraham's family and his descent unless you are circumcised. But all of a sudden, in one conversation amongst elders, boom, circumcision was no longer necessary for salvation. Wow! The book of Acts makes one thing very clear over and over again. God calls Christians and his church to adjust and adapt. Adjust and adapt, adjust and adapt, repeat over and over again for the sake of the gospel, to fulfill the mission that God has given his Christians, his children, and to the whole church. And in the past 16 months, whoa, let me ask you this question. 
how many people here have had to make a lot of adjustments and adaptations in their own personal life, in their work life, in their married life, and as a church we had to do that as well. Adjust and adapt. And as we keep moving back now to some sort of normalcy, that new normal has to stay. Has to stay. We see until Jesus returns, is a new normal we're going to have to keep on experiencing and remembering and realizing. It's part of our DNA as a church that I'll share in a moment as well. Adjust and adapt. For individuals, families, businesses, and for the whole church. We might not like it because we prefer, prefer routine and consistency. Right? You come into church, as people are coming back to church, you're starting to mark out your territory. This is my chair. <laughs> <laughs> you might not have to say anything but sometimes a look will just let the person know you're sitting on the wrong chair <laughs> sit somewhere else it's okay <laughs> adjust and adapt adjust and adapt can I tell you something God never as he lost a Christian church had people just sit down and twirl their thumbs. Uh -uh. God put them on an adventurous, faith-stretching roller, roller coaster of a crazy ride. You buckle up, hang on, and enjoy the ride, and God will be with you through the valleys and the peaks and the dips and the upside downs. And we can't expect that as life gets back to some sort of normal, that we're not going to have to adjust and adapt and repeat over and over again. And one thing that just kept this church going strong and many other churches going strong. I mean, we adjusted and adapted overnight going on Zoom. Then a few weeks later, Zoom and Facebook Live. And we were allowed to regather here at the church. We had a group of people that came together with such amazing skills and knowledge and put together a whole new computer system and camera to make sure that we can keep projecting from here to people who are online. And we had children's ministry come back together again. What are the protocols there we've got to follow and all that kind of stuff. And they did children's ministry together. Social media was just going crazy and all that kind of stuff. And many of you adjusted and adapted as well in the way that you give to this church no more plates were being gathered around and stuff. You put it in the box in the back or online or through text to give. Adjust and adapt. That's part of our DNA. That's part of our culture as a church. In fact, if you go to our website, Northside Community Church, I encourage you to do that. Go there, look under About Us, and click on Mission Values, Mission Vision, and Culture. And one of the things says the following. Times change. Culture changes. Methods change. But Jesus doesn't. And it says the following, to be successful, you have to be able to adapt to change. As a church, we choose to hold methods and ministries with open hands, knowing that as culture shifts, what might be effective will also shift. But our doctrine, we still hold with a closed hand. The gospel never changes. The authority of the Bible will never change. And we rest confidently in this tension between a timeless message and temporary methods. Oh, wow. Some of you might may feel really uncomfortable with this idea of adapt and change, adapt and change. No, please, I'm tired of that. Oh, but if you want the mission to keep moving forward and God to fulfill his vision for our lives and for this church, for our city, for our region, for our province, and to the end of the earth, adapt and change, and adapt and adjust. Fourth new normal. It's actually as well part of our DNA as well. And I want to say to you, thank you. Thank you. Because what I'm about to share is the critical reason why this church has made it through in the past 16 months and why I believe this church will continue just thriving and growing because we've been living this way in the past 16 months. It's actually been part of our DNA, but we've seen it come out in spades in the past 16 months. Jesus actually prayed for this, not just for the church, but for marriages, for marriages and families who have been successful and thriving through this time have lived in this way as well. What was Jesus' prayer? John chapter 17, verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you're in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. 
I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one, as we are one. I in them, and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me, and have loved them, even as I have loved you, or you have loved me. <laughs> Northside, thank you. Thank you for your dogged determination, your tenaciousness in ensuring that we as a church express love and unity. Love and unity. And the world will know, Jesus says, when we live in love and unity. In fact, just a few weeks ago when we had our Father's Day service and we were outdoors, what were we experiencing? Two churches Two different cultures coming together in love and unity to worship Jesus, to preach the message. And you know how the, what impact it was having? I don't remember the exact details, and Sarah could correct me afterwards, I'm sure. But there was somebody, a friend of hers, I think on social media, in Blucher Street it was, right? Okay, she's nodding her head, so I got this right. Put a comment on thinking, where is this music coming from? Right? And found out it's coming from this church. And she asked, turn it up! <laughs> Turn it up! <laughs> Churches coming together, us coming together in beautiful love and unity so that the world will know. Let's keep going as we press on, as life gets back to normal. Let's keep living like that in love and unity because the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1.9, and here's one thing that's nothing new under the sun. The devil will try his best to destroy and divide two of God's most favored and beloved institutions, marriage and the church. We read, I believe it's in Ephesians 4. But do not give the devil a foothold in your anger. Oh, unfortunately, we've heard of too many marriages and too many churches that have divided, been angry and bitter one another over inconsequential issues. You can have differences of opinions and disagree, but you still maintain love and unity. But we'll hold on to that which is most critical. As scripture tells us, who Jesus is, what he did for us, and the way to heaven. That's critical. Critical love and unity. And we as a church tenaciously resisted the devil and lived in love and unity. And again, I want to say thank you. Let's keep it going so that the world will know and will bring glory to God. Okay, the third one, the final one that you've all been waiting for. <laughs> I'm glad you're seated, and I'm going to sit too. What I'm about to share is not very pleasing. In fact, it's not a part of my pastoral ministry, any pastor's ministry, that they just look forward to doing Paul was a mentor to Timothy. Pastor Timothy was left behind in the church in the Ephesus uh, to build that church and grow that church in Ephesus. And Paul sent a second letter to him. And near the end of that letter, he closed with words that are full of encouragement, a good reminder, and a challenge. Listen to these words. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching. Love it. Pastor, keep preaching the word. Keep teaching us the word. That's beautiful. Yes, that's wonderful. And then he goes on with two other words that makes us feel quite uncomfortable. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, and correcting and training in righteousness. Therefore, Pastor Timothy and all pastors, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. So with these words as part of my calling as well, I want to share with you a new normal we've been seeing in the past 16 months that actually needs to change. It can't be part of our new normal as life goes back to some sort of normal. 
In our family, I appreciate so much that our 21-year-old daughter and 18-and-a-half-year-old son, teenager and young adult, still want to hang out with mom and dad. <laughs> they still want to talk to us. They call us for no other reason than to say hi. How's your day going and share with us life? We talk in the living room. We talk in the backyard. We talk upstairs in our bedroom. How would it feel as parents that as your children get older, the only time they contact you is because they need something from you? Or worse yet, they don't even take any measures, any effort to contact you in the first place. Don't even want to hang out with you. And there might be some parents who are experiencing that, and that's so painful, that's sad, it hurts. The book of Acts reveals one very constant reality that birthed the church, sustained the church, and grew the church. Yet it's this one reality, unfortunately, in most westernized churches, they have abandoned it. We have abandoned it. And it can no longer remain as our new normal if we want to be the church that God wants us to be. If we want to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Can't remain like that. What is it? Listen to a few scripture passages I'm about to read as a church was being birthed and growing. What were people doing? Acts 1.14 They all joined together for potlucks. They all joined together to have coffee and chocolate chip cookies. All things are good. Those things are great. Uh -uh. They all joined together constantly in prayer. along with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. That was Acts 1.14. Acts 1.24. Then they prayed. In Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Acts 4.31. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Folks, we cannot expect Northside Community Church to experience a powerful movement of God. We can't expect this church to experience revival. We can't expect this church to be a powerful witness and see our friends and family members and neighbors be followers of Jesus Christ, be baptized right at the front here and start pursuing being disciples of Jesus Christ. We can't expect God to do the immeasurably more than we can ever ask or imagine if we don't even come together and make the ask in the first place, if we don't come together to pray together. You see, in, an Afro, in our affluent, uh, westernized, individualistic society that we live in, we have not made praying together a priority. Truth be known, even attending church, learning and growing in the Word, is often considered an inconvenient necessity. What do I mean by inconvenient necessity? Oh, I, I don't want to go to church. I, I really don't want to read the Bible, but, but I guess I should. I mean, we have to. Church, Christians, God has commanded us to gather together and to pray. It's the example that we see that birthed the church, that grew the church, and birthed new believers and growing believers 2,000 years ago. Miracles happened. Lives got changed. A whole city got transformed. Jesus' blood birthed the church. He prayed for the church. Many martyrs died for the sake of the church. The local church that gathers together and prays together becomes a powerful beacon of light and of hope and transformation for the very city that God has planted us in. And if we want God to see 
Northside's mission and vision be fulfilled. We can't do it just alone on man's strength. We got a God-sized vision before us. I've read it before and I'm going to read it again and I might remind you on a regular basis because we all play a part in making this happen and us gathering together to pray is the only way that we're going to see this become a reality according to God's will. At Northside, our vision is this. This is a God-sized vision that by the fall of 2023, we will see 200 people of all ages and diverse nations worshiping Jesus together with a focused attention on growing, reproducing disciples, building uh, godly marriages and families, and raising up passionate leaders. We can't do that in our own strength. We need to come together to pray, asking God to do the impossible, to do the immeasurably more, to, to see His kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, to fight against the devil and his principalities and his powers. They'll try to knock down a church. They'll try to knock down Christians we fight against him by our prayers together. Listen, somehow or another, in the midst of our busy, crazy, out of control lives sometimes, where some people are working seven days a week, 24 7 on call, whatever it may be, what I find rather interesting that all of us, in the midst of our busyness and craziness, what I find really interesting is that somehow or another, we find a way to make the time to do what? To eat. We make the time to have three meals a day. I mean, sometimes our lives are so busy we skip lunch or skip breakfast. But most of the time, we know we need to eat three meals a day because it's important to our health. But somehow or another, we don't make the time or we can't make the time to hang out with our church family and pray together once a month to the bread of life, to Jesus Christ who gave us life who birthed the church, sustains the church, and grows the church that he loves so much. You see, we will make time for what we value. And if God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit values the church coming together to pray together, shouldn't we? Once a month, we're invited to fast and to pray. Last Wednesday of every month, fast and pray. Every month is a different theme that we focus on. Every month I'm going to encourage you to fast and pray in the midst of your hunger pains. It's a trigger saying, okay, let's pray. And I'm inviting everybody to come together at 5.30 for one hour once a month. One hour once a month to pray. Pray for one another. To pray for what our focus has been that day. To pray for the church, to pray for our neighbors, to pray for the three people we've been praying for all this year. To care for one another, to love on one another, to sometimes be in silence, to hear the voice of God urging us and guiding us and encouraging us. Once a month. I've shared this story before and I'll share it again. I, I've not found a more powerful story or more poignant one. Jim Cimbala was invited to go to a church and pastor a little decrepit, dying church, building falling apart, small group of people, and was feeling so discouraged, so defeated. Nothing that they were doing was making a hint dent or difference. He went away crying out to God, God, what, what, what do you want me to do? I'm tired, I'm exhausted. I want to give up. What do you want me to do? And God spoke to Jim and said these words, my house shall be called a house of what? Prayer. So he went back and shared with the congregation, here's what God spoke to me on. And we're going to be at church that every Wednesday night we're going to be gathering together to pray. One prayer evening, packed with people, Jim Sabella had a guest. 
that was in the back row that at the end of the service came towards the front. He recognized who it was. It was a friend of his. I asked Jim if I can have the microphone for a bit. He went up on the microphone, stood up and said, you, you, you know how popular a church is by how many people show up on a Sunday morning. You know how popular a pastor is by how many people show up on Sunday night. But you know how popular Jesus is by how many people show up Wednesday night to a prayer meeting. The name of that church that was old, decrepit, falling apart, you might recognize it. Brooklyn Tabernacle. <coughs> Prayer reveals our dependence on God, our wholehearted trust in Him, our city, the salvation of our neighbors, our friends, our family is dependent upon us coming together and praying together. The growth of this church, the growth of God's church around the world is dependent upon His people coming together to pray together. Absolutely everything is dependent upon that commitment. Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. Listen to the plural pronoun that gets used over and over and over again in just a few short verses. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, verse 22, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you, you is plural, see the day approaching. preaching this sermon. But I would do an injustice to God, to His Word, and to us if I don't preach the whole counsel of God's Word. Even if it may need a little bit of correcting, adjusting, We pray for revival, or we hope for revival out there. We hope for revival within our families, that they would love and pursue Jesus with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. But I wonder sometimes if we need to go before God, like David did, and say, God, search my heart and see if there's anything in me that's not according to your will. That David even says is wicked. God did not birth his church and plant his many churches around different cities and towns and villages around the world. just to maintain the status quo, just to coddle the believers and give them what their tickling ears want to hear. 
He birthed the church because through the church and only the church can we be a source of hope and light for a dying world out there that is dying without Jesus in their heart and they're going straight to hell. We can't be sitting on the sidelines when we know that reality is happening. We can't expect that they will be saved and be transformed just by our man's effort because only man will get the glory. We want God to get the glory. He invites us into this adventurous, roller coaster, faith stretching, thrilling ride to see the world be transformed with the gospel message to be his witnesses. And the way we're going to start and the way it's going to grow is when we come together to pray together, coming before God and pleading with him and praying and caring for one another and caring for our neighbors in our city. And say, God, please do this. Have your spirit fall down. Our mission at this church is to see people move closer to Jesus. Once a month we come together to pray for that. Will you join in? Will you consider it as a high value in your life? Please? I love God's church. And I know you do too. You wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be online if you didn't love God's church and His people. I love each and every one of you. And I love you too much not to say, are we ready to do this? Are we ready to pray together? To see God do the miraculous and the impossible? To see this church and online and around the world just explode with new believers and growing believers all to the glory of God. To see our leaders even be transformed, our political leaders, our business leaders be transformed and believe and receive Jesus. Could you imagine what our businesses would look like, what our cities would look like if we have these leaders say yes to Jesus? Father in heaven, <clears throat> all I can think of right now, Lord, is to pray the prayer that you taught us. If you want to pray this prayer too, if you know it, let's join together in praying it together here and online. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.